welcome to my channel on the best of fantasy. Today I'm responding to a challenge issued by Iskar Jark, and I will put a link in the description below to that video in which he issued the challenge to us Malaz tubers to do a video in which we do a focused study on a female character from the Malazan Book of the Fallen. I thought it was a wonderful challenge and I'm very happy to finally be taking it up here. And I, at the time that he issued the challenge, I was reading Gardens of the Moon and I immediately thought about Adjunct Lorne as the character that I would think about and try to explain. And I think that when I was reading Gardens of the Moon, she was probably the character that, funny enough, I responded to the most. That might sound weird to some of you, I don't know. But for me, I was actually fascinated by the tragic story of this character. And it probably has something to do with the fact that I've also been thinking a lot about morality. Now, I am no ethicist, I am no expert on the subject of morality, but it is something I've been thinking about a lot lately, and in the context of reading the Malazan Book of the Fallen, during my reread, I've been thinking a lot about this topic. And so, in a way, this video is my response both to Iskar Jarek and my pondering about the, the topic of morality. And they kind of dove, the two dovetail nicely as I'm going to talk about adjunct Lorne. But first, I want to talk about um, morality in some more general ways and then discuss it a little bit in terms of how I see it in the Malazan Book of the Fallen and then talk specifically about adjunct Lorne. Now, I want to make clear that I am not at all uh, trying to represent Steven Erickson's views on morality here. Uh, rather, this is simply my response to the Malazan Book of the Fallen and what it makes me think about morality. And I recognize that other people might respond differently. Also, there will be spoilers for Gardens of the Moon only in this video. I will not be doing any spoilers for books beyond Gardens of the Moon. Now, I want to start by talking about a piece in a magazine that my father actually forwarded to me. It's a, a magazine that is put put out by BBC Radio 4. It's a uh, volume 21, number 13, and the title of the article is Our Dangerous Devotion to the Second World War. And this is an article by Alex Reary, and I, I apologize if I'm mispronouncing that name. It's R-Y-R-I-E, Reary. I'm going to say Reary. He is a professor at uh, Durham University. And the reason, the reason I think my father forwarded this article to me was because it mentions Tolkien specifically. And so I'm going to give a brief summary of what Professor Reary had to say in his article. Now, as you might guess by the title, Reary describes the looming place that World War II has in our cultural mythology. Our culture's most potent moral figure, he says, is Adolf Hitler, who teaches us what is evil. And I, I'm sure that most of us would agree that calling someone a Nazi is the greatest moral condemnation of our age. And for good reasons, of course. And, uh, but, but Riri does cite Godwin's law, which is that all online arguments end with someone calling someone else a Nazi. And to judge by the polarized political climate here in the United States, I'm not going to comment on that much, but uh, you, you can see where Riri is coming from. And uh, people of all stripes uh, often describe their opponents as Nazis. And so I do think that Riri might be onto something here. Uh, we know with deep conviction what is evil, but we seem to be less sure about what is good. And so Riri describes this as uh, a morality that is not affirmative. Is it a negative type of morality? Now, this is really just a summary of, even though it's not a very long article, it is a summary, so I'm losing a lot of the nuance that is in the article, so please keep that in mind as I'm doing this. But Riri also mentions Tolkien in the context of this morality that is anchored in World War II as a cultural mythology. And so Tolkien, in his real life, of course, opposed the Nazis and their brand of racism. 
And in his private life, actually, Tolkien had a lot of nuance. He understood that the Allies all had a, and, what he, and he wrote in his letters, a, a great many orcs on our side. And that, quote, we are attempting to conquer Sauron with the ring. So there's definitely a lot of moral nuance on Tolkien's part, and that is something that Riri acknowledges in his article. And he quotes those letters in that context. But in his tale, Tolkien gives us a, um, a well, he does give us some fundamentally good characters who suffer from corruption, for example, Boromir. Uh, and then there are some supposedly evil characters who show that they are redeemable, at least potentially, like Gollum, for example. But for the most part, moral purity prevails in The Lord of the Rings and in, in, in Tolkien's mythical war against evil. Sauron is like Hitler. Uh, and, and of course, it's not just Tolkien. It's not just Sauron here we're talking about. We're talking in fantasy. You're Voldemort. We can talk about Darth Vader, Shaitan, really any number of others in which you tend to see a good-evil dichotomy. It's something that is, I think we can acknowledge is fairly common to fantasy, especially classical fantasy. Riri suggests that this negative morality may not be enough. And he discusses how inadequate it is to meet challenges like climate change and a global pandemic where we seem to, he, this is a great quote from his article, where we brought a spitfire to a germ fight. In the real world, aggressive heroes don't get to blow things up and, or slay armies of evil orcs who are uh, irredeemable without any consequence to save the day. It's, it's actually uh, much more complicated than that. And so here is where I want to finally bring it around to Stephen Erickson's The Malazan Book of the Fallen, where I see an exploration of an affirmative morality that takes the complexity of the real world into account and is based firmly on empathy and compassion. And I want to use Adjunct Lorne as a very small example of the way I see this morality working. And there are many, many others uh, that you can see throughout the series. But for me, Lorne is one that I've been thinking about a lot. So first I wanna say that Erickson does not give us the good-evil dichotomy that was central to classical fantasy. I don't think that's a very controversial statement. And obviously there's no Sauron in the Malazan Book of the Fallen. There's no Shaitan, there's no Voldemort. And we don't get to feel righteous along with the hero as he carves through armies of evil, irredeemable orcs or other baddies. In fact, the race that most closely resembles orcs in the Malazan Book of the Fallen, as some of my viewers have pointed out before, would be the Jagat. And they might actually have a claim to uh, behaving in a more moral fashion than most humans, although there is the exceptional Jagat tyrant, of course, raced being an example you will know if you've read Gardens of the Moon. But Erickson also does not give us the amorality that many rightly or wrongly associate with modern fantasy, particularly the grimdark kind. Now, we could have a whole video about what grimdark is or isn't, Either way, I don't think that Grimdark is an appropriate label for the Malazan Book of the Fallen. And uh, Malazan is not advocating the lack of morality that many people seem to imply when they use the phrase moral relativism. Now, I don't think that's what moral relativism, relativism is. It is not a lack of morality. It is simply positing that morals are rooted in their respective cultures that morality is not something that exists in some platonic plane or anything like that. So again, I don't wanna get lost in that um, particular um, debate. And by the way, there's a wonderful series of videos that has been done by Ruth and Bad. I'll put a, a link in the description below to his channel as well. And these explore some of these moral issues and uh, Steven Erickson has given some really wonderful replies to those videos. And one of his replies to the video on uh, Bidithal, I think it's called Why Bidithal Matters, that is a reply that suggests to me that Stephen Erickson is not advocating moral relativism in the Malazan Book of the Fallen. Instead, the Malazan Book of the Fallen clearly, to me, upholds a, an affirmative morality in the form of empathy and compassion. 
And while Erickson shows us many terrible acts in the 10 books, he also leads us to try to understand, though not necessarily condone uh, those who commit those terrible acts. Through his unconventional use of perspective and his incredibly vivid characters, Erickson presents all sides to a conflict. What strikes me the most is the incredible sense of connection that he creates between characters in the story and also between characters in the story and the readers. And this is a, these are moments of recognition that for me leap out and shake me with the realization that I'm staring in a mirror. Now I'm going to finally bring this around to adjunct Lorne. And I want to make it clear that I am not in any way condoning Lorne's actions and the excuse that she was just obeying orders in service to a relentless empire does not wash for me. Now, to be sure, unleashing a highly destructive supernatural being on a city full of civilians in order to weaken your enemy is a pretty messed up thing to do. And that's not the only thing that Lauren does that is questionable from a moral standpoint. Yes, she is a cog in a wheel, but she is an especially powerful cog whose conformity to the powers that be has some massive repercussions. However, there are at least three key scenes in Gardens of the Moon that Erickson includes that do not allow me to dismiss Lorne as a Nazi or as a servant of Sauron. The first scene I would like to talk about is the dinner party where Dujek One Arm averts a duel between Tattersail and Adjunct Lorne. Up until this point, we, the readers, have identified, I think it's fair to say, with Tattersail. She is a feels like a fundamentally good character who seems to carry some vague guilt around with her from her past. But it, like I said, fundamentally good character. We identify with her. We're pulling for Tattersail. In comparison, Lauren up to this point has seemed cold and unsympathetic. Yet, Erickson turns the tables on us at this dinner party. It's Lorne who is the wronged one here. And it's a pretty terrible wrong as we learn that Tattersail was responsible for the massacre of Lorne's family and a whole bunch of other innocent people. Lorne was an orphan seized by the empire and shaped by Lassine into her obedient arm. And I hate to think about what training was involved in that. Lorne's anger in this particular scene humanizes her for me. And again, for me at least, it, it allowed me to form a connection with her that I previously did not have. The next scene that I want to talk about is really more a series of scenes, and it is Lorne's interactions with Tool. I want to say that her interactions with Tool actually also serve to humanize her, ironically, given what Tool is. And it, there's a lot of humor even involved, very dry humor, yes, uh, <laughs> between Tool and Lorne, given who they are. But uh, when Lauren accompanies Tool to release Raced, the, the jagged tyrant, she does so in a state of uncertainty. And that is something I think that Erickson makes very clear. Yes, she ultimately makes the wrong choice. As I would say, her despair wins out over her humanity. But it's a tragic decision with tragic consequences, not only for other people, but for Lorne herself, for this character. The fact is that Erickson makes us recognize Lorne's humanity, even as she goes through with this atrocity. And that is something pretty brilliant. Lorne is conflicted, I would say broken. And finally, there is Lorne's death. And this is something that is initiated by Blues of the Crimson Guard, and it is finished by Mies and Irilta. She is later found in her last moments by Ganos Paran, who takes her sword and carries her body away, presumably for a respectful burial. This is not a moment of gleeful triumph over evil. 
it is a scene of tragedy and pathos, for me at least. There is a sense of loss, perhaps what could have been. The potential in Lorne had she chosen not to free Raced. I couldn't help but think of the glimpse we had of the orphaned girl, made into something cynical by her losses and the indoctrination that forged her into the adjunct. This is not a character whose demise made me happy. Instead, I found myself thinking about how such a person might have been comforted and perhaps turned from the course that she took. And once again, I would say that this empathy that Erickson created in me is an example of an affirmative morality. And perhaps it is a morality that is just what we need for our times. I would suggest that it is so. But as a final note, I would like to say that Lorne becomes an exemplar of a sort, an adjunct 1.0, if you will. In the next book, Dead House Gates, we glimpse the next adjunct who will face similar decisions in regard to service to a voracious empire that demands the negation of humanity, morality, and empathy in its service. Now, I'm not going to give away any spoilers here for the rest of the series, as I said, but I will say that uh, keeping Lorne in mind, it's really worth watching how Adjunct 2.0 handles it. And by the way, there are some really great videos if you're curious or if you've already read the books and you want to see some great videos on Adjunct Tavor, Adjunct 2.0. Uh, the video I mentioned earlier by Iskar Jarak is dedicated to Tavor. And there's also a recent one on the channel Niflrog's Folly, which I found to be really excellent. So if you're interested in Adjunct Tavor and some great thoughts on her, I'll put a link in the description below uh, once again to Iskar Jarek's video, but also to the one by Niflrog. Um, so thank you so much for listening to my rambling and I hope you will join me again soon for my next review. I'm just about finished with uh, uh, Valor by John Gwynn. So I'll be reviewing that on my own as well as having a conversation with three fellow booktubers about it. And that will appear on the Library of Alexandria. So until next time.